one thing you have to think about a lot is, you know, if you have this emotional scene where somebody's passing away, you don't want this crazy, beautiful, you know, violin line that's detracting from that moment. You kind of want to stay beneath it and give yeah. some emotional chords and soundscape. Maybe you do have a solo violin that's doing something beautiful that's not detracting, but you're not doing any, you know, you're not doing anything from like, you know, uh, uh, Rimsky-Korsakov or Tchaikovsky. In collaboration with Zoom, the makers of the Q2N 4K camera. Welcome, Nick Petrillo, to uh, MIDI Talk. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, MIDI Talk is the audio modeling podcast that uh, we have created to, to share uh, the experience from uh, many artists all around the world. We met uh, a lot of people during our research uh, when we discuss uh, the technology and topics about our products and sometimes uh, the stories that we collected are very interesting. So we decided to create this show. Of course, <laughs> it's not a super TV show, but we are at home, you are in your studio uh, during this pandemic time, but uh, it's yeah. nice to be here and and to, to have fun together and to share the experience from uh, a real artist. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. Uh, Nick, could you start telling something about yourself? What um, what uh, do you do in uh, in the music industry? And then we, we will move forward to, to talk about the relationship between your job and experience in the technology. Sure. Well, I um, I was originally trained as a classical musician. Uh, I actually had zero music technology uh, education until about my teenage years, about 15 years old. Uh, but I had a lot of the classical and jazz influence leading up to that. Um, and one of the things that really uh, drove me into music technology was a field called film scoring, which I'm sure a lot of people listening right now know about. Uh, it's, it's putting original soundtrack music over films or advertising campaigns or TV programs. Um, and what drove me into this line of work, uh, I, I loved, uh, movies like Star Wars, Indiana Jones and, and movies like that growing up. And, uh, I, you know, fell in love with the music of John Williams. So at the time I thought it was all orchestral and, um, and scoring, you know, either pen and paper or through finale. Um, and then going into an, or you know, going and doing a large orchestra session getting a mixing engineer, you know, and then basically doing a cue to cue and placing that music into the, into the picture. Yeah. Um, but I learned differently when I attended Berkeley College of Music, uh, where I studied film scoring and, uh, they were, that was really the catalyst for me into software synthesizers and DAWs and, um, SIPTI time code and exactly how we lock music to picture nowadays. Um, obviously, in the digital era, we're not using things like uh, punches and streamers anymore. I see. Um, so, SIMTI timecode is very much uh, a part of that world now. Whereas with punches and streamers, you know, say you were conducting a 4 4 pattern, um, your streamer would go past the screen and then you would get one frame of a punch and it's just this white dot that would show up. And the conductor, uh, whoever it was, would have to conduct into the pattern and then hit the downbeat on that punch to make sure that the downbeat was hitting a certain um, frame of the of the picture, uh, based on you know the the emotional context of that. Um, yeah. You know, but nowadays uh, a lot of film composition is production. It's a lot of drum loops. It's a lot of um, Synth uh, even soundscape creation in things like absinthe or any contact where you're layering sounds, layering different sounds and patches over each other, playing with attack and release and decay and all kinds of stuff to, to round the sound over a, a given amount of time. So say you have a 20, a 20 bar cue, you know, a cue mm -hmm. is a piece of music that exists in the, in the film. 
Sometimes you have a single note or two notes that are swelling based on the attack and decay and release. And that is actually what's formulating the soundscape or the sound. Um, and that's all sound design. That's all music synthesis. Cool. Um, it's a, it's yeah. really interesting. So what is the connection between uh, the musician and uh, the, the movie director? What is the workflow? So how, how do you start uh, for making music for, for movies? First thing is uh, we work in the world of post-production. So in mm -hmm. film, there's pre-production, you know, getting the script and then the production filming. And then post-production is audio and music. So we're getting um, what's called a locked picture. And a locked picture is basically the, the final edit of the movie or the advertising campaign after the video editor has done everything. It may not have all of the visual effects, it may not have any, all of the audio effects, but we're working off of a picture that is locked and the, the time is designated. So from a locked picture standpoint, we'll get that, we'll view it, okay? And then generally we'll go into a meeting with the director and or the producers, uh, music supervisors, all the entire music team basically will go into there. And we take what are called spotting notes. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, let's just take a TV show, for instance. Yeah. Um, a TV show may have, let's say, 20 cues. And a cue could last a minute and a half, two minutes, up to five minutes. Depends on how long that music is. But a cue is basically, you know, a, a scene or a, a piece of the film uh, that you take as an emotional um, uh, piece that you may need to score. You know what I mean? So let's just say there's an action sequence and then it goes into a very dramatic scene between uh, somebody who may have just died or who is dying. So one cue is the action sequence. We tackle that as a chunk. And then we tackle that emotional dramatic scene as a chunk. Okay? So we have all of these different cues that we're scoring. Uh, we're not scoring, say, a 40-minute TV show. We're scoring these different chunks. Yeah. And then you'll have you know, your music editor who will go in and crossfade between these cues so that your action cue, if you have a long tail, is crossfading into the, into the long transition into the next cue. Generally, the, the idea is you get the spotting notes, and then we will go um, from there. Uh, the composer, the assistants, maybe there's multiple composers, whatever the case may be divide up those cues. And then really what it comes down to is watching the visual and figuring out what the emotional intent is of that piece. And what we're always doing is adding to that emotional integrity and not detracting from it. The music is yeah. always secondary. If yeah. the role, role of the uh, uh, film scorer is to always stay behind, you shouldn't really be heard. You know what I mean? Yeah. It should I be see. adding. It should be adding to the emotional. So b basically, it's something that has the power to uh, enhance, to amplify uh, yes. the feelings that uh, are uh, just created by the script, the uh, the, the exactly. edit. So one thing you have to think about a lot is, you know, if you have this emotional scene where somebody's passing away, you don't want this crazy, beautiful you know, violin line that's detracting from that moment, you kind of want to stay beneath it and give yeah. some emotional chords and soundscape. Maybe you do have a solo violin that's doing something beautiful that's not detracting, but you're not doing any, you know, you're not doing anything from like, you know, uh, uh, Rimsky-Korsakov or Tchaikovsky. You know, there's nothing huge and grandiose about that. Back when, in the, in the 70s, you know, the yeah, 70s were pretty much the orchestral revolution pack. Uh, you would have dramatic moments like that, but we're, we're kind of out of that phase now. A lot of it is soundscaping. So to me, it's really fascinating. Also, yeah. um, I, I was curious um, uh, um, to know your opinion about um, yeah. uh, the, the, the role of music uh, on, um, let's say, on, on Tarantino's movies. Uh, he, he had a, an approach of making a contrast yeah. between what you're hearing with what you are watching. So this is also yeah. another technique, right? Man, but, uh, it's all, but that's always at the discretion of the, of the director and the producer. Yeah. I mean, Tarantino's films are so pulpy and so um, 
there's almost a psychotic approach to what he's doing that that works, man. You know, uh, I think, what was it? Uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, didn't he have the Stones playing during that whole like barrage scene at the end? I mean, it's just, it's just so counterintuitive to what's actually happening at the end there. Yeah. Um, it actually, it actually does add an emotional support if that's where you're going. Look at Spielberg. I mean, Spielberg still does these grandiose film scores, but then take a film like Schindler's List. I mean, that's one of the biggest epics, epic movies of all time. Yeah. There may be only 15 cues in that movie. And a lot of it is just that Schindler's List theme on, on the cello and the violin. I mean, that's basically what it is. Yeah. And uh, he's chosen the sp- the, the sparseness of that score that's that's an approach to film score yeah you know but if it, a lot of the stuff i'm doing is you know commercial film scoring for network tv which is you know it's very uh cut and dry um you know this is the, this is how it works you know we're not yeah. really doing much out of the box with that yeah i i suppose also that the role of technology when you're you're working for um uh, TVs uh, mm. um, is also important in terms of uh, facilitating your workflow because uh, the time is really important because uh, you cannot spend, I suppose that you cannot spend a lot of time on, on each project. Um, so what, what is uh, um, your experience in, in this area? Uh, well, it's, it comes down a lot to extra hands. Um, and it also comes down to, you know, reuse of certain cues. You know what I mean? where we will uh, sometimes, if, if a certain cue actually fits the bill on, an, on a later episode, you do some alterations to it to fix it into the actual cue format. Honestly, uh, the sound design comes before we're even scoring. You know, yeah. a lot of the things I have are loop libraries that I've created or soundscapes that I've created that I just push into, um, you know, I'll just run it through contact, really. Um, and then, you know, I, generally how I do it is I run audio plugins on top of whatever I'm doing to alter the sound, which you can do, you can do a lot of filtering, you can do a lot of distortion techniques, you can do a lot of, e- even EQing will, uh, will change a lot of sonic sounds. Um, but that's ge- my, generally my workflow is, um, you know, if I can get five to eight minutes of music done a day, uh, fully produced, I'm, I'm in good shape. Mm-hmm. Cool. So yeah, yeah. So that's that's one aspect of my job. And then I know you and I had talked a lot about um, live performance, and uh, I do a lot of music directing and a lot of touring. Um, so I divide, I really divide my time a lot between those two. And uh, as far as the music directing goes, um, obviously Camelot is is a huge help with things like that. Uh, nice. But but it comes. It comes down to the ability to integrate hardware synthesizers, software synthesizers, and some type of DAW rig, whether you're running Logic or Ableton, or if the drummer is running some type of clock system that is running into my boards via MIDI. Yeah. Um, nowadays, a lot of performance live is heavily production. Um, including arpeggiators, including, um, uh, say, filters that are, are, are running on a certain BPM that we need to lock into the clock. It, it really depends. Um, and, uh, you know, all of that, everybody needs to be on the same page, including the drummer who may be running loop libraries, who may be running uh, different tracks that need to lock into the grid. Uh, and then on top of that, then maybe you have, you know, horn backing tracks that are running on top of that or uh, background vocal tracks that are running on top of that. Um, and then I know we're, we're kind of pushing through and getting into the weeds, but, you know, sometimes, you know, you'll get hired, a music director will get hired and will fly out somewhere. And uh, we're basically working with an entirely new band. We're running tracks, we're working off charts. And how do we uh, integrate all of that stuff into something absolutely brand new? Uh, that nobody's seen before. Um, and that's, that's really where things get tricky. And honestly, that's where I personally, um, love track. I know a lot of purists don't like backing tracks, but I love them because there's a, there's a safety net there almost of this is what it will always sound like. Do you know what I mean? 
So it's yeah. it's a way also of having um, a certain level of quality and uh, also a, a musical idea that you can bring with you. Uh, yeah. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, because, you know, you, at, at some point when you're working with an artist, that artist wants to hear exactly what they want to hear. Yeah. Um, you know, if you had an entirely new rhythm section, new, not necessarily horns, uh, but an entirely new rhythm section, and, and say the drummer was uh, going to groove on something completely different than what the artist is, is meant to hear, that's going to affect sonically uh, what's going on. Whereas if you're running a bunch of conga tracks and percussion loops, well, the drummer is now locking into that groove and that's always going to be consistent, you know, around what's happening. So I, I, I go, tracks are, are such a, such a, a safety net for me <laughs> when it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to ask you yeah. a suggestion for people that are approaching uh, yeah. the live performance uh, and how they should, uh, uh, start um, in, in terms of uh, using technology. Many people are scared about the use yeah. of uh, technologies. Well, there's many different approaches to music technology. I would say just to get your, if you're brand new to it and trying to get your feet wet, I would go with learning the basics of, of analog keyboards that have been digitized. So I would go first with what is a what is a Fender Rhodes? <laughs> what are the what are the what are the different things we can put on a Fender Rhodes? You know, well, we could put a tremolo effect, we could put a chorus effect, we could put a phaser. You can add, you could throw it through a Fender amp, guitar amp, like a tube amp, and uh, and run it through some warm distortion. Just right there, you can do a lot of stuff. And all of a sudden, I mean, even with tremolo patterns, that tremolo needs to lock into a certain tempo. Even though you may be working as far as uh, the rate goes, um, so there's two different ways that time-based um, effects work. There's a rate or there's a tempo, uh, BPM-based. So BPM-based, we would obviously lock that to a clock system. But what I'm talking about right now is a tremolo with a rate-based. And a rate, you're going to have to work it around your tempo and find out where it's it's rotating correctly that tremolo. So all of a sudden, just by working with a Rhodes, you already have an abundance of sounds that you can work with. I mean, running a Rhodes through a distortion effect is already, it's gonna make it almost sound like a synthesizer. Yeah. Um, I would start with that. And then I honestly, if we're getting into digital technology, I would pick up a program like Absinthe or Massive or, or something out of the contact realm. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly feel like contact is one of the mainstays of technology right now. And, and just dig into um, oscillators first, you know, figure out. So an oscillator is obviously like an electric, uh, electric signal, like a, a waveform, right? Yeah. And just see what two different waveforms against each other is going to sound like. Don't worry about anything else. And then try to detune them a little bit, see what that sounds like, you know, and then, you know, try to add some, some digital effects on there, you know, and see what, all, see what the synthesization of the whole thing does, uh, increasing your release time, you know, what does that do? Or, uh, decreasing your attack time, what does that do, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and just get into the weeds a little bit with a synthesization engine. Yeah. Um, that's kind of where I started, and I, I know I'm, I'm kind of speaking of it like it's easy now because you know back when when I was in college, this stuff scared, <laughs> scared yeah. me to death. Really, I mean, I had I had no idea how any of this stuff worked. You know, no, it's a really a good point. Uh, I can, um, I, I totally agree. I think that the way of exploring is yeah. uh, is also easier now because we have access to virtually any kind of uh, tone generator because yes. with the software instruments and now you can really experiment yes uh, some years ago it would not be possible you have to find a mini moog to uh, to tweak uh, <laughs> exactly yeah you need a hardware synthesizer to get anything you know yeah i honestly i think you can download um one of contacts synthesis i forget which which one it is you can download one of them for free there's a bunch of user based libraries on there that you can just you can just get there and start messing with stuff and see what other people have created you know 
Yeah, um, absolutely. Also, it, it is it is curious because here uh, at audio modeling we we also yeah. make uh, the Swarm instruments that uh, they are uh, virtual acoustic instrument based on physical yeah. modeling. Right. And uh, and uh, we can yeah. also tweak and. Uh, shape the sound of an acoustic yeah. instrument yeah. Uh, uh, according to the physics of the instruments yeah. so it's also another journey of discovering so i i i, I totally agree what uh, what you are saying well you know virtu virtual modeling is so crazy man because you know that's whereas we're talking about oscillator you know like tone generators now you're talking about sample based um electronic music which is basically somebody in a studio, say at East West or the village or somebody, sat there with a violin and played A as a long tone, and then played A as staccato, and then played A as a portamento and to say G. And now you have these library, gigabyte, sometimes terabyte long libraries of <laughs> just these sound. And like what you said, man, you could either use a matrix or a crossfade library or round robin technology, or even throw it into a into a sampling engine and manipulate these acous acoustic sounds um, and, and to make them whatever you want. You know, I mean, I don't know if we were talking about this with uh, with Camelot before, but you know, there's the there's a lot of vocal libraries now where you can type in the background vocal you want. I mean, word word for word to an extent. I mean, they're still getting this technology, but but you could type in a sentence. And then play a line on the keyboard, and they'll sing it back to you. You know, we're getting we're getting to that level of sampling technology, which I think is insane. Yeah, we we are also approaching the um, the virtual acoustic instruments in terms of uh, recreating the the physical model. So we um we are also going beyond the technology of sampling. Yeah. So it's uh, for for us, it's uh, really a journey of discovery that started from the curiosity and the ex experimenting how to yeah. tweak the sounds. Our CEO, Stefano, always told us that uh, he learned a lot, uh, as you said, about sound design when he had to, to work on constrained system, like the mm. first uh, uh, D50, Roland D50, uh, yeah. or um, other uh, synth that uh, um, didn't have uh, huge resources, but if you wanted to, to create uh, the sound that you had in mind, you had to to, to work on that system. So. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's crazy, man. <laughs> yeah, I remember, so. man, back in my college, this was 2007. I mean, the best library you had was VSL, Vienna Symphonic. And that was like, man, I think like the Platinum Library was 20 grand or something, right? It was something insane, dude. Um, and me as a little, like a college student, I had, um, was it Garrett, Garrett personal orchestra, which was like, you know, 300, $300 or something, man, you know, and it, it, the, the audio modeling was not, it just was not there, man. You know what I mean? The acoustic modeling of the whole thing was not there. Um, and dude, now, I mean, I had the subscription to, um, East West, uh, the composer cloud. I think yeah. it's 200, 200 bucks a year or something. And the sounds are incredible. And you're talking, what, a decade, you know, a little more than a decade from, uh, from then. I, it's just, it's crazy how far it's come and how far it's going to probably go, you know. I would like to ask you, we talked about uh, a bit of, of live performance yeah. and also um, of, of the music production. In the music production, um, or but let's say also in the live performance, um, yeah. what is the, mm, the subtle, it, it's, it's a little slippery uh, topic, but I would like to, to talk that with you. Pe some people say that the technology is going to, to reduce work to, um, for, for a real musician. Uh, what is uh, your opinion ab about uh, that, uh, that part? of the technology. Do you think that virtual instruments will replace uh, real musician? Do you think that uh, uh, live performance software will replace people yeah. on, on stage? What is your uh, experience on that and the uh, thought? Well, you're right. Thought? It, is a, it is a slippery slope. So I'm going to start with uh, when I, 
I'm going to start with one thing that I know for sure. So Broadway, uh, you know, New York based musical theater, right. Um, has for many years, if not decades, started moving away from, you know, say chamber orchestras or, or pit bands into more digital formats. And not, not saying that, you know, we're losing the acoustic instruments. I'm just saying rather than having keyboard one and two and a slew of live musicians, now sometimes you have keyboard one through five. Yeah. And then you're piling stuff on top of that, right? And the reason I start with this concept is I think it's so prevalent throughout the music industry. Because even in film, com film composing, where there is a huge um, need to do things in the box, you know, because it's going to save time and money, there will never be a substitute for a live musician. And the reason I know that is because we're still hiring, say, a chamber string orchestra to record over a massive orchestration just to add a little intonation, a little buzz, a little of the realness of a string player. Now, I'll tell you, if you have a violin one patch and one violin nicely mixed into the top of that, it brings out a, a whole other um, uh, emotional, you know, it just brings out more into the music, I will say that. And, um, I, you know, even in live settings, man, I mean, listen, if I'm with a band and we can only hire two horn players, well, I'm going to do top note of voicing on a on a synthesizer, and trumpet and sax are gonna are gonna play that. It's gonna sound it's gonna sound fine. It's gonna sound like there's five, you know, horn players on that job. Me doing a synthesized horn, it's gonna sound terrible. It's gonna it's gonna sound like a synthesized horn. Um, to answer your question, I think is it is going to make it harder to book gigs if you are a, a, an orchestral musician if you're string player, horn player, what if you're a keyboardist, luckily we're okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it has made drummers' jobs a little harder to come by. It's made bass players a lot harder to come by because key bass can be done pretty well now. Mm -hmm. Guitarists will always have a job because it's very hard to, you know, mock up how a guitar player plays on a keyboard. Yeah. Um, it has made things harder, but it's not going to completely go away because it. we need we're just generating the digital sound of what a real instrument is. You can never get the digital to be as, as great as the, the real thing. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I really agree with you. Also, I can tell that in, in other episodes, I uh, made the same question and yeah. I got almost the same answer. Same answer. So, cool. Uh, many, many uh, producers are, uh, are layering uh, libraries, with uh, on top uh, uh, swarm instruments to make more realism and on top of that real uh, players so um, it's yeah. just a chance to uh, to use your budget in the best way you can yeah. and uh, hire um, the people that you need to hire and and, yeah. and create the best music that you can I, I i totally agree and um, i'm happy to hear that you have the same experience oh. the same point oh yeah 100%. I, I would like to, to ask you if you have um, a favorite gear or something that is uh, really important in your uh, experience that has changed maybe your approach. You, you mentioned something at, at the beginning of this uh, chat, but uh, if you have uh, something to share, it would be yeah. nice. Uh, well, I, a few months ago, I was introduced to, well, let me give a backstory because, you know, for a while now, I've been using a lot of different things. Um, <clears throat> so probably for about seven or eight years, I've been using Ableton, which has really been the only program I could use to run a track and a click track to the band. And, um, you know, then all of my hardware sense and my software sense would have to, I'd have to basically lock that into a DI and just go straight to the board and, and deal with it that way. Um, so I was running tracks like that. And I, sometimes I would be using Logic for a lot lower gigs. I would just use an iPhone or an, an iPod. Um, but a few months ago, uh, I was talking to um, everybody over at, uh, uh, at Ilio, right? Yeah. Uh, over in uh, Westlake Village. And we were talking, uh, 
about this program called Camelot. And they said I should give it a shot uh, just because of the nature of my work and the fact that I could not find a program that integrated my synthesizers that I could send out to the drums with a clock system because I need to be setting up my click track that I could run my tracks. And also one of the biggest things for me is that I could run a PDF or a chart of my song and I could actually lock that into um, my track and I could lock all of that into set lists. Um, and honestly, for so, so long, all of this stuff has been on different programs. <laughs> I've been trying to find out how to do it correctly. Um, so now, uh, what I'm actually, because of Camelot, the, one of the things I'm doing is, uh, moving everything into MIDI keyboards and, uh, just moving everything into software. Cause, you know, for a while, uh, this board right here, this Yamaha, uh, motif right here, this is, a uh, basically been my gigging keyboard and I've been programming everything hardwire. So I'd use this and I'd use a uh, Nord Electro 3 uh, for all my B3 samples, um, for Clav, for, uh, you know, Rhodes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, recently I picked up Keyscape. Yep. So I can just use Keyscape uh, through the software uh, as a soft synth. And uh, I'm running basically all my contact stuff. I run all of that straight through Camelot honestly. And I just run my patch changes through that. And um, it is absolutely brilliant, man. It is such a brilliant program. And uh, one thing, I, you know, my drummer, um, my drummer is really into the S SPD lifestyle. He loves, he loves the, um, you know, running tracks based on the pad system, right? And um, he's been looking into Camelot as well. I know you and I have been talking about this and as yeah. far as getting some Octopad uh, uh, software integration into that. Because honestly, the, you know, the whole thing is just, it's so, such, so beautifully streamlined. Um, it is completely changed my workflow. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. So do, do you have uh, any, any requests for the industry? Um, not only for Camelot, but uh, if you, if you have uh, any ideas or suggestions, something that uh, you, you really need uh, right now? Man, something that I really need right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I know we had talked about it. The only, the only thing I really need is, is some type of universal uh, uh, click system. That's all I really need. Yeah. You know? The reason I, I believe that is so crucial, man, is because the more vocalists I talk to and the more horn players I talk to, back when, where they would like to use wedges and they'd like to, to, to blend through the wedge, uh, a, a lot of them are loving uh, going through in-ear monitors. Yeah. And I believe that in-ears, uh, I think they already are, a, you know, a huge mainstay of the industry. But I, I, I think even when it comes to bar bands and smaller cabaret joints, I think they're going to become a mainstay. Um, and, and the reason I think that universal click is so crucial is it's, it makes all of those moments on stage, you know, those pauses or those big stops, it locks them into a certain time zone. And I think that's going to help as far as perfecting music because everybody nowadays needs this perfect music, right? Yeah. Um, and one of the things in live music that could, you know, kind of throw things off are fermatas, are sejours, are pauses within the music. And I think, uh, you know, the universal click track and being able to get everybody on the same page, uh, is going to really change the game of, of live music production. You know, whereas it's, it already has kind of been that way for pop music. I think it's, it's on its way to become a thing in the cabaret world and in, in smaller, uh, niche markets, I would say. Really, really interesting. Yeah, Thank yeah. you very much for, uh, yeah. for this uh, for this point. But yeah, I mean, as as far as you know, gear, I I love all all of the, you know soft. So I feel like I said, software synths are going to keep growing and, and become more and more um, comprehensive. Um, the 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 more intricate we can get with uh, vocal synthesization. You know what I was saying about yeah. you know to type things and, and play them, vocal articulations, um, different samples within the vocal library. I think we have a long way still to go with 
foreign libraries, although Contact has one called Session Pro, which Session Horns Pro, which is amazing. Um, I think we still have a, a long way to go with uh, uh, horn modeling. Um, and I think guitar, you know, guitar as well, it needs work, but I, I think we, we need work with, with that as well. And the closer we can get to these sounds, the more we can get into a nice blend, you know, because better horn samples on top of that horn sound are going to sound great, you know. Yeah. Cool. Nick, yeah, thank you very much for uh, being here at the MIDI Talk. I hope to uh, to talk to you again uh, to discuss the, the new feature of uh, Camelot and our products. Uh, your input, uh, your opinion is uh, very important for us. Sure. And thank you for uh, for this uh, for to tell your story and your experience here at MIDI Talk. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I can't wait to come back and talk to all you guys again about uh, the developments in Camelot. Very exciting program. I think everybody should be getting a copy of that. Thanks. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>